mute mine after speaking so my name is uh, dr anup anup Anu, you need to mute your uh, microphone yeah so my name is dr anurag mishra i am the founder of livonix uh, livonix institute of integrated learning and research and uh, this is a place where we believe where we uh, believe in transdisciplinary learning and uh, research we offer a number of uh, courses here and they are offered by unique people people who are who have themselves traversed at least two disciplines and offer a unique uh, view on the subject that they are teaching and at the present moment we are offering seven courses one of which is beginning on 2nd of february 2 to 2022 uh, movement medicine and the others in the next month they are a wide variety and range of courses from psychoanalysis to psychiatry to leadership to creative writing to intellectual property to design thinking to rajat's course movement uh, medicine now one second uh, joy can you just put down the music for a bit uh-huh. i introduce yeah. you and the topic today yeah was, yeah one second so yep here we are so i remember an occasion where i was in the audience uh, many years ago i was in chicago and there was a very famous psychoanalyst andre green who was receiving an award a lifetime achievement award and he gave a lecture at the end of which he was asked a question uh, to which his somewhat irritated response was that you know this this is why this is what you get when you don't teach philosophy in school in america and at that moment he very much reminded me of my own father whose favorite uh, refrain was is why don't they teach logic in school that uh, you know people do illogical things i think both of them were ruining the fact that people don't think straight or think in a logical man now the problems of logic and thinking straight have been you know relegated and mastered by people in the information technology sector you know people who do programming and who study programming logic and so much so that they can break down speech and you know entire texts into you know the perfect logical uh, format they they can now computers can now beat humans at straight thinking and do it faster than them and better than them whether it is in the realm of you know playing games like chess or even algorithmic trading uh, they are now being used to design worlds in which humans can live in but the problems that we are now facing are not problems which are amenable to the logic which was not taught also in school and college earlier the problems that we are facing now now for example you know coronavirus is one problem climate change any of you can take up any problem whether it is uh, and uh, whether it is right now or you know a bit in the past but these these are all problems which are not amenable to the brute force of computers and you know so called logical thinking these problems are complex problems and these problems can even be said to be wicked problems they are not wicked in the sense that they are immoral problems but they are wicked because they aren't so- soluble by pure linear logic you know different people have defined wickedness and wicked problems differently joy will talk about it but you know the, you can talk about wicked problems as being illogical 
you know, they are unique problems. They are uncertainly interminable problems. They are illogical problems and they are irreversible problems. They are very, very important problems. And they can even be said to be super wicked problems because the super comes from many factors, which again, Joy will talk about. But one of the factors is that time is running out to solve them. If you don't solve them, uh, you know, to, not to put too fine a point on it, we are screwed. That, there are many other characteristics of uh, super wicked problems, which I will leave to Joy to delineate. But, you know, being my father's son, I now view the fact that what is not taught in school is not only logic, but also the kind of thinking that Joy will demonstrate to us is design thinking. It's a kind of thinking which deals with complexity and complex problems, problems which are not linear, which involve multiple stakeholders and in which there is no place from which we can see them you know, objectively, that we are completely involved and surrounded and we are part of the problem. There's no easy, uh, you know, right, uh, uh, right or wrong solution. There are only grades of good or bad solutions to these problems. So let me introduce um, Joy to all of you. So Joy, Joy is a senior fellow at this institute that I told you about, the Livonics Institute of Integrated Learning and Research where he teaches the 12 week course called Thinking in Design, the philosophy and practice of design thinking. Now Joy qualified as an engineer from what was almost my alma mater, uh, Birla Institute of Technology, Pilani, and then went on to study design at IIT Bombay, now Mumbai. He co-founded Wood Apple, a digital design firm 25 years ago. He was part of the team which won the Rockefeller 2050 Food Vision Prize, and now is part of nonprofit organizations like the Food Future Foundation. He mentors some very interesting next-gen artificial intelligence startups on product design and user, user experience design, so-called UX. And he's currently involved in extending design thinking to complex social problems, working with the UNICEF in Kenya. So now I hand you over to Joy and uh, I will sit back and listen. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And I know I shouldn't have shared my PPT with you because you literally stole all my <laughs> content. <laughs> no, thank you very much. So uh, uh, I come to wicked problems, as I'll explain, uh, from the field of design. And um, being designed, you know, I've got to show and then I've got to do. So uh, I will uh, share my presentation. Uh, I want to make it very, very interesting. And in case there's something that you need to stop me and ask me a few questions, please do that. And Anurag, if I tend to drift a bit, you can always hold me back. So I'll just share my screen and uh, we'll just start. Okay, so I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, it's visible to me. Okay. Okay. So um, to start with, let me just give you a bit of a background. Uh, I trained as a visual communications designer, uh, but that was like 25 years back, more than that. Uh, and it was a very exciting time. So, you know, personal computers, they were they evolved from a you know, mere curiosity to an essential part of uh, everyday life. Uh, information evolved from physical print-like information to digital libraries. Uh, the internet uh, wireless communication was really uh, rocking at that time. Uh, then uh, the, the world of design itself was changing quite a bit. That was very, very interesting. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, so there were multimedia authoring tools which are coming in. DTP, uh, especially with Apple, had become really, really big. 
uh, and you could see photographers, you know, they're starting to sneer at digital and saying that you know, it'll never be as good as print, which knew that something's really going to change. Uh, but digital at that time was very, very rough around the edges. The bandwidths for minuscule, uh, the dot-com bubble that happened did not help. Uh, but as it always happens with all systems, there are tail events. We'll discuss those a little later. There were tail events like 9-11. And uh, the reset button was pressed and things got really bad because as they do get bad before things get better. Um, and now again, one of those major tail events which happen every hundred years, I realized that pandemics are real. They're just not a concept they teach you in biology books. Uh, but these times really are the times when you rediscover and investigate the cause of design uh, because that's when the wicked problems and the super wicked problems, they come into focus. And design thinking is, at least that's what I propose, is one such opportunity and a challenge. Um, so this entire talk is in view of some of the things that uh, Livonics is doing. Uh, you know, we are trying to put together some sort of a curriculum which really gives us that future think. And as Anurag talked about, you know, from psychology to brain sciences, neural networks to supercomputing, uh, getting people to run, as Rajat would teach, uh, to getting people to evaluate their lives, uh, you know, in coaching and all that, uh, from creative thinking to creative expression. So we've got creative writing courses and to protecting these intellectual assets. So it's completely sounds crazy. Uh, it's very hard to find a common thread, but then if it wasn't, then it won't be a wicked problem. So, uh, I'll take you through the model of this presentation is that I'll take you through some of the case studies, some stories. Uh, these stories were actually pivotal uh, in, in the revolution of what we now call the Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is essentially blurring the lines between, you know, the man, the machine, you know, like that. Um, and I'll try and sort of uh, weave them all into a very coherent narrative, uh, even if they they seem very disparate, but they're all, they're all converging at a point. Let me just, okay. So the first uh, uh, case study is called the Three Mile Island Accident. Uh, this was actually a partial nuclear meltdown um, in Three Mile and Island uh, nuclear generating station. It's called the TMI-2. This is near Pennsylvania. And this happened in 1979. Uh, this, for me, I've used it in many other presentations also, is one of the scariest design-led disaster in American history, probably in the world history. And it is certainly the biggest uh, commercial nuclear power uh, disaster in the US. You know, a few years later, then we had the Chernobyl which literally killed off the entire nuclear industry for a very long time, especially the commercial nuclear industry. But why this one stands out uh, is because there is such a huge, uh, you know, involvement of poor design uh, in this particular case. <clears throat> so um, this was the, the photograph uh, a few, taken a few years back. Uh, the one on the left, as you see, the one which is not working is the TMI-2. One on the right is TMI-1, Three Mile Island uh, Reactor 1. Uh, those big things setting off so much steam uh, are basically the cooling towers. Now, nuclear energy, as you know, uh, uh, basically they run, uh, uh, they have turbines, and these turbines are really steam turbines. So they need a lot of water. So water for cooling and, uh, and water for making the steam, which essentially then runs the turbines. And that's why they're sort of uh, made close to water bodies, like the one that you see right now. Uh, of course, because of you know, what happened then, and this TMI one, they ran for around 40 years after the accident flawlessly, there was no problem. Um, and it was shut down, I think in 2019, uh, because again, it's very expensive to keep uh, running a few nuclear reactors you need it at a scale now coming back to the problem that happened was uh, uh, there was a partial meltdown uh, due to a very small problem 
150 tons of uh, uranium in the reactor core had hit uh, 4300 uh, Fahrenheit, uh, which was, you know, just 700 degrees less or 30 minutes away from a complete meltdown. So what would have happened is the entire core would have melted down. It would have gone through the huge steel encasement and gone into the bottom of the river, throwing, obviously polluting the river and throwing up geysers of uh, nuclear material into the air. And this place, I believe, is just 150 miles from Belsenvalia itself and the, you know, the cities nearby. Uh, after three days of this issue, a uh, small amount of radioactive xenon, krypton, iodine, you know, uh, they had to be let out of the reactor. And around 140,000 people had to be evacuated. So it was pretty big. It did not become uh, Chernobyl, but it was still very, very big. Don Norman, who is the father of uh, user-centered design, he's the one who actually uh, investigated this problem. And a lot of things that I'm talking about right now is from his uh, investigation. So uh, 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 being a heat generating system, you know, uh, there are obviously ways of cooling, you know, when, the, when, the, uh, the, when there's any problem in the nuclear energy plant, the plant starts to shut down, it starts to cool down, you know, where the reactions are happening. So this particular thing, I'm not going to go deep into what happened in the accident, uh, but very briefly, there was a release valve at the top of the reactor cooling system. So in the control room, this valve was so important that it had its own light and it had its own switch. But it turns out the light was just merely wired to the switch and not to the valve. So when the light came on, it just meant, uh, you know, the switch you know, that the switch is on or off. It did not mean that the valve is on or off. So a small thing like that. So the status light did not indicate, you know, uh, you know the correct status of the valve itself. Um, and because of this single piece of, uh, you know, Ms. Bicotton feedback, the valve stayed open for hours as water boiled uh, in the reactor core and sending the temperatures to around 5,000 Fahrenheit when the complete meltdown would have happened. So coming to you know, design problems here is the system did not give out the right kind of a feedback. And there were many other issues uh, that happened. One problem led to more problems and more and more wrong decisions were taken. But it was basically a small loss of coolant. That's all it was. So the light was on and it merely was making intent, but no action. So now if you look at the control room, this was from you know, the archives um, and this was the control room then how it was. Um, it had you know, sort of switches and uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, there were 1100 dials, uh, it seems. 1100 dials, gauges, switch indicators and more than 600 lights. Uh, but they were not put together in any kind of a fashion where you can understand as to you know uh, as to how the reactor system was set up, right? So uh, on the panel, so the engineers are very neatly put, stacked them all together in a neat fashion without ever thinking as to what they mean. So in design, we have something called Gestalt laws, you know, that talk about uh, visual perception, similarity, proximity. So those laws were completely broken. And in the panel indicating, for example, uh, reactor leaks was next to the one announcing elevator problems. Now, these two things are completely, uh, you know, uh, a different scale of problem altogether, but they were all together. This particular light that I was talking about, which is for that wall was somewhere at the back somewhere, which couldn't even be seen uh, from the front. Um, and when Don Norman did a review, he found that there were 14 different meanings for red. There were 11 different meanings for green. Some meant good things, some meant bad things, <laughs> right? Uh, the, like I said, the controls were not grouped in any kind of a fashion where you can discern what they mean, you know? So uh, the pieces of reactor, pieces of non-reactor, pieces of turbine, they were like spread all across. And more importantly, very critical indicators, like what is the total water level in the cooling system? that was missing. 
So what the engineers did was they pushed a lot of water in and they thought the entire water would die. If you put more water in, the, the pipes would burst. So they switched it off. Unfortunately, because the wall was open, most of the coolant was leaking out, right? The computer system that you see on the left, the printer, it was printing out temperatures. But after 700 degrees, it was just printing out question marks. So they didn't even know what the temperature was. It was only found out the next day uh, when the investigations were done. And the funny part is, and here's the rub, actually the plant, the way it was engineered, it behaved beautifully, just the way it was meant to be. It would have saved itself because it's a nuclear plant. It has many fallbacks. It would have saved itself if the people had left it alone, you know? So they went and tried to switch out the water thing, thinking that it would, you know, uh, burst the, uh, these things. But if they just let it be, it would have worked perfectly fine. Just because we started fiddling and imagine all these lights uh, blinking at the same time, what would happen? So the machine could not understand you know, uh, at the bottom line is the machine could not understand the imagination of men. and <laughs> The men could not understand or imagine the workings of this machine. Uh, that was it. And by the way, uh, most of the people who worked here, they worked in uh, nuclear submarines. So they knew how to work in um, pressure, serious pressure, but they were completely at loss. It was finally saved by a guy who still questioned saying, okay, there's something's wrong. You know, why is the temperature still ri uh, rising? So he went and switched on the fallback. And very slowly, the system came back to normal. The fallback to that wall, that's it. That's all he did. And that would have been triggered anyways. So this is how uh, the problem of navigability, consistency, uh, meaning, uh, these were completely lost. And all these things, you know, navigability, consistency, meaning, uh, pattern, they all put together something called a mental model. And mental model becomes very, very important for all the kinds of problems that we solve. Now, moving on, and this is pretty interesting. This is the second step of understanding complex problems. Now, what you see here is this very large uh, plane. They are the B-17, uh, they were called the B-17 flying fortresses. Uh, and you can see apparently it looks like it's, it's got no wheels. Uh, that's because it's crashed. So during World War II, uh, for a period of two years, it's incredible, over 480 such bombers and fighters, uh, they crashed. Uh, and they suffered these accidents and nobody could understand. Just before they were coming to land, the pilots would retract the landing gears. Okay, During the war, nobody bothered. Uh, and they kept saying what they call is very standard pilot error. Okay. But here's the story, the story of B-17 bombers and B-17, B-25 bombers. So B-17 and B, uh, B-25 bombers and these other planes, they rolled off the, you know, the drawing board within a year. Uh, and, you know, during the war times, the things happened very, very quickly. And there was a massive advancement in uh, technology around that time. And it became very quickly, it became one of the fiercest workhorses uh, for the US Air Force. Uh, it was known for its astounding uh, toughness of its body. It had four engines. Uh, it had over 12, I think, um, guns on them. So people used to just love them. And bombers typically have a large crew that they fly. Okay, the front is all, you know, glass. So, you know, the visibility was also brilliant and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but unfortunately, all these problems happened. Uh, and they kept at it. So you would think that if something's happened 400 times, you would have time to you know, fix them. But this was war time, you know, and, and most of the official uh, things would be pilot error. So after the war, uh, the Air Force called this very young experimental psychologist called Paul Fitz, Dr. Paul Fitz. And uh, for Fitz being a psychologist, and he had enormous amount of data you know, 400 odd planes crashing like this. And it was really a tragic or comic uh, piece of information. Planes would, coming to land, they would inexplicably just land without the landing gear and they crashed like this. There would be, uh, there, would, there were fighter planes where the uh, pilots fell off because they couldn't figure out which side was up. Uh, in one of the uh, air raids, 
this guy pilot went and jumped into a plane and they saw all the controls had changed it was a new plane so he didn't know how to fly it so all he did was he sort of you know he drove it like a car up and down the runway till the raid was over so things like this happened so as a psychologist he was there to understand patterns he could understand patterns and every time he looked at these uh, b17 bombers and these accidents he could not find anything which was random okay he found young pilots he found experienced pilots all of them doing the same mistake so he had a hunch that something is wrong with the machine for the first time you know before that machines were gods so <laughs> he sent this guy called alphonse chapinis uh, another uh, psychologist to do the looking and what he found was very interesting the controls of the landing gear and the wing flaps they were right next to each other they looked and felt identical so it was his very clear hypothesis and looking at pictures and all that is this is what has been happening the guy is trying to put the flaps up and what he's doing is pulling the landing gear up and imagine you know uh, it's all perfectly nice bombing session your plane is all safe the crew is all safe the night is great wonderful of flying and as you fly down you get this here this horrible crash of metals <laughs> so and this was the first time and this was a pivotal moment because chapnis called it designer error and this was the first time anybody used that term and what he did was even more interesting he couldn't change the entire plane but uh, you know the entire control system but what he did was he did what is now called the shape coding so he made the landing gear knob look like in landing gear as you see on the left the flaps were made flat you know so they so you know most of the bombers are flown at night you have to go by your touch so and he made the shape coding for all these things so a propeller gear would be made like a propeller the same concept then actually made the entire avionics very very safe it's the same concept that has been used for so many things today the game consoles they all have these weirdly shaped controls that's because you're looking up at the television or wherever at the visual display while you're not really looking down and feeling so you have to go by touch or the haptic response so and then of course al went on to pioneer industrial design uh, <clears throat> and he's considered widely the father of ergonomics or human factors so that's another thing that we need to study and uh, basically ergonomics is a science of taking you know human characteristics into design and uh, <clears throat> and this redesign of b17 was really the first time that it occurred to us that we should accommodate human behavior instead of retraining human behavior to fit the machines and this really was pretty big um so these guys really paul fitz and chapnis and the reason i'm talking about them is because they come into our conversation again and again they invented this new paradigm of viewing human behavior you know so you have to design many a times uh, not all the times but many a times and these are called edge case designs uh where people have to work without thinking you know in the, that fog of everyday life where things might not be perfect so you're making things for a very distracted confused person under duress where the cognitive abilities are diminished so whether it's flying or whether it's surgeries you know in all kinds of such high tension difficult circumstances edge case designs become very important but is also very important for people who have certain kinds of disabilities so you have arthritic you know joints you know you can't hold your knife and things like that so it it really the human factors made a huge 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 difference to uh, product design after that and uh, just a few years uh, after the nuclear accident actually seven years to be exact uh, somebody came up in silicon valley with this very interesting thought saying that you know if computers were so smart wouldn't it make sense to teach computers about people instead of teaching people about computers and these guys then uh, they worked long days and nights teaching those little uh, you know silicon chips about people you know how people make mistakes how people change their minds how they labor for the livelihoods you know how their work life is how they doodle in their spare time so you know all that and when they finally finished 
they introduced us to a personal computer which was so personable you could literally uh, you know shake hands with it and uh, uh, me and some of my friends in idc iit bombay would be very very happy and fortunate to have worked on this which i think is the cutest computer ever looks like a baby computer but it was extremely powerful and those days absolutely a marvel for desktop publishing uh, and design so it was really really a class apart from every other computer that we worked on so um uh really you know the whole summation of that piece of work was that if when you know something works well you can literally predict what it's going to do uh next so and then you have what you call as a mental model of it mental models are two types uh, you know uh, they can be deep or shallow uh, in fact they are usually deep and shallow and uh, and they're uh essentially classified so deep ones are system models and shallow ones are interaction models so a cards steering and brake and all that and the dashboard is all your shallow interaction model the engineering inside it is a deep model so uh, you know there were days when people knew both um uh, and uh nowadays of course something else has happened so uh and that's the final uh, thing that i'm talking about is that to master how any machines work uh, typically it needs to adhere to a uh, pattern language now this is where uh, i want to introduce you or rather ask you you know which is the most prevalent uh, pervasive mental model of digital age at least till uh, some years back when desktops were everything uh, it was this the same computer that i showed you it has this interface we may have forgotten what a desktop is but this was a mental model of what we already know as a desktop but this is an american desktop so the trash can looks like those silver trash cans they used to have uh, those days uh, and this is concept of a calculator on your desk uh, files and folders and inboxes and outboxes so this is how the entire desktop paradigm was taken by mac and they created this entire gui um and very interestingly uh mr paul fitz that he was talking about he delivered a uh, uh, a law you know which has been guiding macintoshes and um, all these guys who made guis for many many years in fact fitz law is being used by apple even in when they are making their iphones but it has modif- it has to be modified for mobile phones um uh, and what is interesting i'm not going to go deep into the fitz law but basically it just talks about you know uh, it's a model of human movement uh, in this case the movement of your mouse uh so anything any object which is large on the screen is very quickly you can get to that point and anything which is closer to you you can very quickly get to the point so basically it's a uh it's a model that tells you how quickly you can go and click at a point this is also the reason why most of your uh, you know uh, menus are right at the edge because edges have what you call as uh, infinite width so you can just throw your mouse right to the edge and it'll go straight to the edge and after that all you have to do is to find the right place to click so macintoshes have been using it it's a very internal thing they've been using it for all their desktops all their software for many many years Microsoft unfortunately did not use it too well uh and that's why the big difference that you see sometimes between these software systems now mental models on their own are not complete because they are limited mental models is always an extension of what you already know but a desktop is only as much about a system but a co- computer is far more complex it has got so many other things so what becomes uh, the key point keystone of actually understanding how the complex world of say computers or any other system world uh, work in this world is feedback and and feedbacks and feedback loops first i'm going to talk about feedback feedback is what allows information to actually become uh, action and this is not only at the level of data but feedback is what we need all the time you need feedback to able to walk uh there is a whole uh subject <clears throat> of feedback which is based on feedback and it's called cybernetics uh and <clears throat> sorry 
So <laughs> these subjects like cybernetics, information theory, human factors, engineering, control systems, systems theory, they're all based on feedback. In fact, the word cyberspace is, is a misnomer because cyberspace was one novelist using that word to describe the world of computers and you know virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera. Cyber actually comes from cyber needs, which is the basis of cybernetics. And it means the art of steering. How you steer a ship to the port. You know, you have to constantly give it, you know, you have to oversteer, understeer, because you can't go straight. You know, the, the waves and the currents and the if it's a wind sail thing, then there would be a wind, which is constantly taking it away from the port. So you have to keep adjusting till you reach the port. So that is where the whole subject of cybernetics comes in. Very, very interesting. And um, Robert Wiener, uh, he founded the field. Uh, and uh, somebody we should always look up. It's, it's brilliant stuff that he has done. Now, here, uh, like I was saying, the natural world is full of feedback. <laughs> but in the man-made world, we have to design it. And the reason sometimes things don't work properly is because the feedback systems are poor. Uh, in terms of the wicked problem that we're talking about, climate change, it's a feedback problem. If uh, pollution made our skies red and you know acid dropped in and things were horribly crazy uh, you know we would take climate change very seriously but because it takes the feedback loops are so long we don't feel the difference and we keep adapt adapting like the, the the frog in the hot water you know we keep adapting to changing conditions we don't feel uh, the feedback it's not an instant so it's a feedback problem uh, so taking that forward, uh, one of the greatest challenge uh, of the century really is creating better, tighter feedback loops in places that they, where they don't exist. Uh, and I'm specifically talking about environment, healthcare, and governance. And uh, actually talking more about feedback issues to have lifestyle diseases, uh, you know, uh, type two diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure. And for youngsters, swimmers ears, people who have headphones all the time, uh, cancer, stroke. So these things, they creep on you slowly and the feedbacks are very soft and you barely notice them. And by the time you notice them, it's, it's a very rapid downhill. So I'll let you read this a bit, but to actually finish this session, which is actually a probably the longest one is um, I'm going to talk about buttons, buttons as we have so, uh, as we saw in the first case and you know even those controls, they are also buttons. Uh, they're the connection point between our will and the user-friendly work. okay? Uh, and feedback that ensures that our will has been done. Without feedback, you know we don't know what's what's happened. So it's only intent and no action. And when we do a good design, with, which, which is what you call as, you know, within the design systems or design understanding of design is when best of the designs really dissolve into behavior. They don't stand out on their own. They don't stand out for their artistry. They don't show that, okay, look at me, I'm the best design thing out there. Design is something, a good design, at least that's the theory of design is, you know, that works brilliantly well that you don't even notice it. It is the simplicity of that design. So with that done, uh, and that's one of the basic <clears throat> understanding of the design world, I'm gonna give you a very, very brief uh, history of design, okay? And it's, <clears throat> it's all about the key influences who shaped modern design. Um, so in that, uh, the first concept that I talk about and that we were taught is form follows function. Uh, form is how things look like, look and feel, uh, or I would say just look. Uh, and function is how they perform, how they work, okay, very briefly. So this entire concept of that function is greater than form, uh, it was brought together by uh, these architects, you know, um, and I think you know them, a lot of them, so Lou Corbusier, uh, Walter Gropius, Van der Rohe. These are all these guys who actually started talking about that ornamentation is crime. I mean, they had to swing the pendulum that way. 
and you have to see them uh, in context of massive cultural changes that happened in the beginning of 20th century. We were really at the aftermath of all kinds of revolution, cultural revolutions, people revolutions, Russian, all over Europe, there were revolutions there. Um, so these guys said, you know, this ornamentation is crime coming from that it was only meant for the, the bourgeoisie and things like that. And we need to bring design down to the last, you know, the one who, uh, who cannot afford. He also needs to have as comfortable a life. He needs to have access to as good products as, as anybody else. So in terms of form follows function, uh, the reverse is also true for some people. So a fashion designer would say form is more important. A product designer might say, you know, function is primary. An auto designer might say, mm, I don't know. <laughs> So because he has to balance both. So, but then this is where, you know, uh, design went from art and crafts to being very, very uh, function oriented. Art and crafts are very form oriented. And the first time this concept was used, form follows function, was actually by an ar architect called Louis uh, Sullivan in the US. And his disciple, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, he is, is one of the biggest architects, uh, of the world in the US. Uh, he's the one who adopted this phrase called form follows function and promoted that. Now, what is important out of this is the guys who thought like this, out of this Walter Gropius and Van der Rohe, et cetera, they founded the school called Bajos. And Bajos was the school of thought and movement that espoused this uh, concept of function. Uh, so what they did was really they set out to change the society uh, and they decided that even small things have big impact. So they designed teapots, table lamps, telephones, you know, and they focused on people's necessities, uh, not luxuries. So uh, the school, Baho School of Art and Architecture, it became very famous for uh, its approach to design. And they, they, try to unify the concept of mass production, technology, <clears throat> arts and crafts, and individualistic artic, artistic vision towards, you know, uh, aesthetics in everyday life. Uh, in a way, I would say they brought uh, socialism to design and design education. Uh, and when the Nazis uh, shut down the school, um, actually a lot of them went off to Soviet Union. A whole lot of them went off to the US and they changed the entire product design scene in the US. Um, and a lot of them went to actually Israel. So if you want to see Bajo's architecture, you probably need to go to your, uh, Israel. This is Walter Gropius's uh, you know, uh, office. And very interestingly, everything here is designed by uh, you know, uh, these people. So uh, you, know, you look at what's there on the top, the beautiful you know, lighting system on top, ceiling lights, uh, the sofa, uh, these modular, you know, furniture that you see, which became actually the base from which the next school was created. All this, this outstanding, what you call as modern product design was done during Bauhaus times. Uh, that lamp that you see there is, is called the magic of frozen light. It, it's actually a classical piece, which is now in uh, MoMA, uh, New York. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful piece. And to understand how interesting this is, is you have to know how things were before this. All on ornamented lamps and this and that. And from there to something like this. It was a huge, huge change. A lot of products that we see today, uh, we don't know where they come from. They all come from these schools. So after that, uh, this, the second school and the last one I'm going to talk about is HFG uh, Ulm. Uh, which had even a shorter lifespan, but it gained a lot of international recognition because they now focused on something beyond just art and technology or engineering. They started talking about multidisciplinary context of design. So they got sociologists, psychologists, you know, people who learned politics, economics, philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. And they integrated aesthetics and technology. So this was a pivotal moment in the history of um, design and it started from Germany. And what is interesting is the their second head, who was the Argentine designer, um, he was called Thomas Maldonado. 
he was a champion of systems design. And we're going to be doing a little more on systems design now. And that systems design, and he actually espoused a philosophy about flat pack uh, designs. The IKEA products that you know today, uh, that's really something that he foresaw. He saw democratization of design through modernism and capitalism. And if you talk about some of the most uh, successful industry initiatives they did, they did a lot of work with Braun, the German company Braun. And literally every household product that we see today has you know, a design influence from Braun products. And um, they designed the German Lufthansa brand identity. They did the railroad in Hamburg, et cetera, et cetera. What they did with Braun was very, very interesting. It has influenced uh, products, like I said, and, and there in Braun, the head of Braun design process were Dieter Ramps. This was <clears throat> a transistor radio that Dieter Ramps had uh, designed. And just look at the design, look at what they did with, uh, it looks like a lost Apple prototype. The curved edges, the stark, you know, minimalism, uh, beautiful scroll. In fact, I like the one in 1958 more than the one in 2000. <laughs> one and but this is what less is more kind of a concept that that approach came to design and Dieter Ram incidentally was brilliant because you know uh, for not only what he did in terms of the products uh, which are of course quite classical and but um, he removed the ego from the entire process of designing he made design what it is today so you would hear of big designers architects filmmakers uh, uh, fashion designers, you know their names because they're constantly planting their identities on their buildings and their products. But Dieter Rams was different. He talked about that, you know, uh, I want to take my ego out. I'm, I'm making something not for myself. I'm making it for everybody else. And I want to make products which do not command attentions right away, may not. But over a period of time, I understand its enduring aesthetic, which is, you know, what makes a product great. Uh, so, and that's, that's what Dieter Rams did. So in summation, <clears throat> um, and that's the whole reason why I talked about all this is design is an integrative discipline and why we are using design to solve difficult problems, uh, because now it doesn't matter where people come from. Uh, so we've got people coming from diverse professions that we talked about. They may not share the common definition for design. They may not share the common definition or methodology. They may not even have the common philosophy, but what they have is, is a mutual interest in, uh, in this theme that says the conception and planning of the architecture, uh, artificial. So this, this entire artificial world that we're creating and that needs to be designed and that needs to be thought through and all these guys, and this definition is not new, you know, this is, this, this comes from, I think, the own school, uh, one of the professors, I'm going to talk about him uh, after this, uh, this is close to 70 years, 60 years old, and the way they saw how design would be is incredible. So moving on closer to, you know, our subject, uh, design thinking, so I'm going to give a very brief two slide introduction to design thinking. Uh, as to what it is. It's, it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, design thinking is not really about design per se. It's about thinking in a design process, right? So it's a problem solving network. So if somebody asked you what is design, a very simple answer would be design is problem solving. Uh, so taking that ahead is, is this problem solving framework. Uh, and this came from designers and that's why probably it's called design thinking because a good designer always holds off uh, you know, solving the problem. So what he would do is you know, he first determines the real problem. So problem statement becomes very important. After that, he's going to explore a range of solutions. Before he settles, settles down to a final you know, set of uh, solutions that he thinks, and then he's going to test it out. So that's a, really the basic, if you want to understand design thinking, that's all that you need to know. As a process, it converges, diverges, you make choices, you create choices, you know, things like that. Um, there are many, many different kinds of design thinking, uh, uh, you know, frameworks. So um, Stanford School has one, 
D school has one, MIT has one, IDEO who started design thing, they have their own. But the one which I like the most, uh, it comes from Professor Jean Litka, who was actually an accountant in a previous life <laughs> from Darden School of Business. And this is such a simple and a very, very easy to explain uh, platform, uh, framework. And it it's just says, you know, what is, so you first figure out, you know, what's happening right now. Then you move to what if, then you remove all constraints and look at all the possible solutions and do a lot of brainstorming. And then you start looking at what wow is okay out of all this stuff, what is really, really good? What is that? You know, the point where feasibility, desirability, and viability, they match, and then which are the ones which you want to work on. And then we do a what works, which is quickly make prototypes and go out to the people whom we are building for, designing for. So we keep keeping them uh, in, in the entire design process. And what is very critical is to have <laughs> visualization across all the steps. You visualize all the time. That's why so much of design as part of the design thinking process. But you don't have to be great in illustration or anything. Visualization can happen in so many different ways. Now coming to our um, uh, actual problem, which is wicked problems. So uh, what are wicked problems? Uh, in design thinking and where I have been working on, <clears throat> these are a class of social problems. Most of the design, <clears throat> <clears throat> wicked problems that I work on, they're social problems. Not that uh, non-social or whatever business oriented, uh, you know, businesses or whatever, they can't have wicked problems, they do. But uh, these class of problems are usually underfunded. They have nobody's attention. They're, that's why they're very hard to solve. So, and, and, and in a sense, they are very ill ill -form formulated, they are, the information is confusing. There is what we call as a certain amount of indeterminacy about these problems. And the one who actually jotted down this entire uh, wicked problem framework was Professor Hospital. He was a mathematician and a designer from HFG Ulm again. So this is that old. And, uh, and he said, literally every problem in design is actually a wicked problem. Is this that as you start formulating the problem better and better, you're just taking the wickedness out of it. Okay. So uh, what he did was he actually gave 10 points. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I added one. So the, he gave around 10 points to explain what a wicked problem is. Okay. So very clearly a wicked problem, it escapes definitive formulation, right? It's very hard. Uh, to figure out, you know, how to formulate the problem. And the moment you formulate a problem, it is giving us a very specific solution to that problem that you formulated, but not the entire wicked problem. So that's one thing. Wicked problems have no stopping rules, which again, it's a very statistical thing to say a stopping rule, but to us, it means that there is no point when we know the problem has been solved. Okay, so there's no stopping rule there. Uh, wicked problems typically do not have a true and false answer they tend to only have good and bad uh, impact. And sometimes in this good and bad also, it's very hard to know whether it's a correlation or a causation. So that's another quality of wicked problems. Uh, of course, in wicked problem solving, there's no exhaustive list of uh, operations. There is no correlated data. There is very little, you know, uh, so to fall back on. And what he said was that wicked problems are, they typically have obviously more than one possible explanation. And a lot of these explanations, they depend on the team which is working on it. In this case, he calls it the Weltanschauung. What the Weltanschauung is basically the worldview where your the designer's eye glazes when he talks about it. So, so Weltanschauung, of the, so it's his worldview and how he perceives the problem. <laughs> That's where the design thinkers need to come in in a group and you know take everybody's worldview in. The next one is very important, which is wicked problems is a symptom of another larger problem. This is where systems thinking comes in. That systems are they're linked to each other, and we are sometimes only seeing a part of the system, right? And almost 
I would say all wicket problems are dependent on other systems. So there's a lot of influences all over. Uh, formulations do, do not have a definite test. Uh, he's almost right, uh, but there is a way to test sometimes. When you do a formulation and there's a clear solution to it that you found through design thinking, you're able to do some tests. Uh, then he says that solving wicked problems is a one-shot operation. There is no room for trial and error, which is kind of true, probably not for only wicked problems, but for certainly for super wicked problems. Uh, you might have seen you know, large governance uh, issues. So uh, there was this Mao Zedong in, uh, uh, I think in China did this four pest thing and great leap forward. They started killing sparrows as pests and they started killing you know, flies and all that. So obviously created a massive ecological uh, imbalance and 1950s, 51, 52, two, three years, China suffered massive man-made famine because of a problem like this. You really can't go back. Uh, he had to import, I think, 250,000 sparrows from Russia. So that's the kind of thing. Once you made a decision on them, there's very little to do your trial and error for. But there is a way to solve these problems. And then every wicked problem is unique, obviously. Yes, uh, there is no analogous data to solve a wicked problem. The wicked problem has no right to be, uh, no right to be wrong. Um, you might have seen that. So, you know, many times when leaders take decisions which have massive impact over a very short period of time, the only thing that can solve a bad thing is great public relations. Otherwise, you know, there's really, <laughs> uh, you know, you can be crucified for that. Um, I find wicked problems to be uh, problems which have got very long feedback loops. And I'm going to talk more about feedback loops a little later. Uh, they make problems really, really wicked. So climate change, like I said, uh, you know, lifestyle diseases, they are very, very wicked problems because you don't see them as problems. Nobody looks at them as problems uh, for a very, very long time. So moving on, <clears throat> super wicked problems. <laughs> this is even more, so you talked about this. So. Obviously, the super wicked problems are where time is running out. Okay. Uh, when you realize that it's a super wicked problem, you suddenly realize, boss, the time is running out and you've got to do something very quickly. Problem sometimes with these super wicked problems is the ones who are causing the problem also seek to provide a solution. So environment, the, the biggest, uh, you know, destroyers of environment, will be the ones who will be in most forums talking about how to solve that problem, okay? Uh, typically, a central authority is too weak. Um, now, COVID was a, is a wicked problem. And, and, and if you go by phase to phase to phase, it literally had really no time to save yourself. The central authority in this case would be WHO or a CDC or whatever we have in India, I don't know who. So they would not have the kind of impact they would want to have. The problem which I find most interesting in this <clears throat> is that policy responses, they discount the future very irrationally. Now, this is a very big behavioral problem. Uh, we have an time inconsistent preferences. So <clears throat> um, we apply a lot more discounting when something is far away in the future. Uh, for example, if I, if you're a smoker, I ask you, you know, tomorrow is a no smoke day. You're going to have a serious problem with that. I say, oh, I can't manage, man. It's too soon. If I say, okay, next week. Okay. I'll try. If I say next year, you know, perfectly fine. I'll certainly do it next year. Uh, the fact is nothing's going to change. I, don't, I mean, smoking is a very small problem from that perspective, big problem for you. Uh, but, but we discount uh, things in future. So what happens is uh, even governments, uh, they tend to focus on near-term issues. Uh, and so are you know, the citizens. They focus on their issues right now. And they, they do not actually try and think of uh, the long-term effects. So, and that's the thing. So you know, that usually becomes a serious, serious uh, problem uh, with super wicked problems. Now I'm going to add one more thing in it. And this is where I was talking about the feedback. 
<clears throat> super wicket problems have something called a reinforcing feedback loop. Now, if you've done systems engineering, uh, you would know about two kinds of feedback loops. One of them is called a reinforcing uh, or a positive feedback loop. Now, positive here is like RT-PCR positive, bad in most cases. Okay, so it has a reinforcing feedback loop, uh, which basically enhances or amplifies the change which is happening. So it moves the system away from the equilibrium. Then there is a stabilizing feedback loop, which are called actually negative feedback loops, which is good. What it does is it dampens and buffers the changes and it tends to hold the system to the equilibrium, a dynamic equilibrium. Most systems like climate and all that, they have all these kinds of loops. They have a negative uh, loop and they also have a positive loop, right? Uh, the reinforcing feedback loops in this case, and what we call as a positive feedback loop is really bad. I'll tell you how. One of the examples is soil degradation. Now, what I read is it takes 100 years for earth to make maybe an inch of a soil. It takes literally two years to destroy that topsoil with your fertilizers and pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens is your soil has turned to dust in a year or so. Now, to make it productive, you want to add more and more fertilizer onto it. You want to add more stuff into it. So it starts, and all those chemicals start leaching into the subsoil and it starts going deeper and deeper. So one problem is going to keep enhancing the problem deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Same thing, I mean, a lot of medical doctors would know if, uh, you know, a teenager has uh, anemia. Now, loss of, less of any anemia, less of iron in the system leads to heavier monthly periods, which actually makes the, exacerbates the system even more. So you become more and more anemic. So these are your, what you call as reinforcing infinite, uh, uh, feedback loops. These are dangerous for super wicked problems. They continue to get worse and worse and worse if you don't do anything about them. So, and here's, uh, I find this a very interesting concept, uh, which I learned in my systems thinking uh, uh, course, is when Jay Forrester, uh, he's from MIT Sloan School, and uh, he's a champion of systems uh, dynamics. And he was asked, you know, how these major problems, poverty, hunger, environmental degradation, etc., uh, they're related and how they might be solved. So Forrester went and, you know, put the whole thing in his computer, bunked it out, and he came out with something what is called as leverage point. And he says that leverage point is growth. Now, the problem with growth, and you'll hear almost every government, whatever, problem to every solution is growth, grow more, grow more, do more, okay? Food, grow more food. And that's how our poverty, uh, hunger is gonna be taken care of. It doesn't work like that. Because growth has <clears throat> benefits, but we don't end up counting all the costs, okay? So when it comes to poverty, hunger, environment, you know, we try to solve them with growth. Unfortunately, <clears throat> what we probably need is slower growth, uh, a very different kind of a growth, and sometimes either no growth or negative growth. And I can actually prove it to you. So talking about food, okay? Uh, there is this concept of food loss and food waste. Uh, they broke it up just so that I think the total number doesn't look so bad. So there's around, assuming, you know, wherever I got it from, around 14% of the food worldwide produced for human consumption is wasted uh, or lost. That is, uh, before it comes to uh, your homes, it is lost, homes or restaurants. There is a 17% loss in your homes and restaurants or other retail centers. Okay. So Total, as you can see, quite a big number. Uh, I can just broadly put it together and say around a third of the food produced in the world for human consumption is lost or wasted. Sometimes people say it's 50%, sometimes one third, doesn't matter. Uh, now look at hunger, okay? Uh, a smaller set of people from that waste and loss is around 811 or whatever maybe a billion people go hungry. Uh, and hunger is of three types. As I see, is, uh, there is acute hunger. So maybe a war or certain incident that uh, you know, makes a large population very hungry. There is chronic hunger, essentially because of poverty. 
and there is hidden hunger that's the hunger of malnutrition okay and a very large uh, number of people who suffer from malnutrition because sometimes it's not just an option it is also a choice wrong choices lead to wrong mal malnutrition just look at it you know the amount of food wasted and the number of hunger hungry people you don't need to grow more right and and whatever you're growing you just need to make it more nutritious so a very different kind of a approach is required uh, to solve these problems another very interesting thing i found is that you know as doctors again a lot of you would know an antimicrobial uh, resistance is long assumed uh, to be you know it's all use of antibiotics use of antibiotics but i read a very interesting paper uh, which says and this is from europe so <laughs> i don't know what happens in india is that corruption levels were uh, as important so what happens is that drug resistant viral strains emerge and they spread throughout the populations because patients consistently have no access to quality medicines if you get poor medicines you know they promise you certain mg of antibiotic and they give you half right uh, that leads to a much bigger problem than just the overuse of antibiotics which is also a problem uh, children fall sick they do not attend school they remain illiterate uh, and there's a lot of absence uh, absent these uh, in uh, healthcare workers in villages and all that there's a massive use of corticosteroids uh, so you know all this this corruption actually leads to the things which we see are as scientific problems or medical problems so again you have to find solutions somewhere else so uh, how we decide uh, does you know design our thinking uh, of wicked problems is what comes under is complex social problems and i find this definition to be very very nice it's that design thinking for these problems it's a non linear emergent thinking a process uh, and the key words here is you explore the <clears throat> problem deeply you empathize which means you get down to the people you are affecting okay and you bring them on uh, to your system you ideate uh, very quickly okay prototypes simply make simpler prototypes instead of trying to make very elaborate prototypes go test it out and iterate 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 i have done a few of these and i know something like this works it's a difficult problem to solve no doubt but this this particular framework is is very very interesting <clears throat> <clears throat> now this is my subject at all and i would really want you know the psychologist in my group to explain this but um the reason why we have all these wicked problems and these issues and future discounting etc cetera, etc cetera, um is because of some of our heuristics and biases so i'm going to introduce just two biases most of you might even know about this but i come across these biases again and again and again uh and some of these biases are countered by a process like design thinking so one of the first biases that i counter uh, which needs countering is the law of small numbers so the people who wrote about these biases uh, nobel laureates daniel kahneman and amos tversky they themselves said it, this this bias is so strong <clears throat> that we ourselves in spite of knowing about it cannot counter it so you know that bias towards a very small sample set thinking that's represent the largest sample set and that forms opinions asking a friend you know uh, you know what do you think and whatever he says kind of becomes my bias okay it must be good because he said it it's a very small set of people that we talk to and one of the biggest biases if you're a leader of a company you think if i think something that must be it so happens in many uh uh you know countries systems where you have a powerful leadership so the problem with powerful leadership sometimes is they tend to take many decisions in isolation and uh, they will suffer from these small numbers because they have a very small set of people they trust so this is what leads to these kind of sometimes very ghastly uh, policy decisions then the another problem that i see as a heuristic and a bias is science of availability i'll explain heuristics in a bit 
Signs of availability is essentially we judge something from the frequency of something's happening. So you start, there's an air crash, you read it in the papers, uh, and suddenly you feel that, you know, air travel is not safe anymore. Uh, nothing has changed. Probabilistically, nothing has changed, but just because it's there in your recall. Now, all these uh, biases are manipulated by advertisers, uh, you know, people who do communication, which are called persuasive communication. But we have to be really be aware of them. These are the biases that we try to break when we're using design thinking. So, uh, and then I'll, I'll, let me talk about heuristics. Uh, heuristics essentially is, uh, you know, shortcuts right? Shortcuts in our thinking. So uh, Kahneman, he and Tversky, when they wrote, you know, their seminal paper in behavioral economics, they talked about our brain having two types of thinking uh, processes. One is type one system and the type two system. So uh, type one system, uh, it sort of uses association metaphors to produce a very quick and dirty draft of reality. And which system two then draws on to arrive at an explicit belief and reason choices. So system two thinks deeply. System one does things quickly. Uh, they're both very important. So when you start to learn a car, for example, you're using a lot of system two because you're learning everything. But after a while, you get so used to it, then it's machine intelligence, which is what you call a system one. You can, you know, you can drive for kilometers without even thinking what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, system two is very lazy. <laughs> That's why uh, heuristics become uh, primary in our decision making. And what I'm talking about is uh, intuitive heuristics, not expert heuristics. Expert heuristics are different. Expert heuristics are the people who have studied a subject properly and then they are giving you shortcuts and then they're telling you do this. Okay, so I'm largely talking about intuitive heuristics. What happens is when we are faced with a difficult question, we would often answer with an easier one without ever realizing the substitution. We need to be aware of this, okay? And, and these are the guys who actually came up with what you call as a prospect theory. Um, so how people react differently to uh, risk and uncertainty. So if I ask you a question, so you know, if you go to a surgery, you're typically given a form you know, to wave off your rights. Uh, <laughs> or whatever. So uh, if, if the doctor tells you uh, there is a 10% chance of dying, the patient will think twice or thrice or 20 times or may not even go for the search. But the same doctor comes and tells another patient and says, or the same patient says, you know, there's a 90% chance of this is this going right. The person would sign it. Nothing has changed. It's the same thing. But the way you put your uh, questions and how you frame them. It's the same thing with, you know, when we do our financial planning uh, percentages rather than uh, how much I save. So if, if you're a uh, nearby guy who's selling a toy uh, near your place, say he's selling a toy at say 300 bucks, uh, 10 kilometers down the road, then another guy who's selling at 150, you'll say, oh my God, 100% <laughs> overcharging. You're going to drive and go get that toy from there. But if you're buying a car, okay? So the guy, a dealership who's next to you, he's charging you 10,000 bucks more. Another one who's charging you 10,000 bucks less. But as a percentage, it's minuscule. You'll say, okay, let me go buy this. In totality, you've lost far more. But you know that's how our brains work. That's how behaviorism is. So um, you know, purely rational decisions would involve weighing all alternatives, potential costs, again, potential benefits, but human beings are not rational. We are rationalizing, and that's a big difference. So uh, to really cap it all off, uh, you know, as our brains are really, we understand stories, we don't understand maths too much, simply. Uh, and, and really knowing this weakness is really the first step in accepting that we have an idealized kind of reality in front of us. When a startup, and I worked with so many startups, when they do their business plan and all, they're always overestimating the positives. 
and under, underestimating the negatives. So it's, it's like everybody, 100%, it's never been any different. So uh, in 1950s, actually, uh, there was this <clears throat> cognitive psychologist called Herbert Simon. You must have heard of him. Um, he is the one who introduced the concept of heuristics. And he suggested that people strive uh, to make rational choices, uh, but human beings, their judgment has a cognitive limitation. So they'll only do so much. Now, here is where I want to actually talk about this word called heuristic in technology and algorithm. When Google replaced the word heuristic with algorithm, it sort of created an enormous uh, deception. I don't know whether it's uh, you know, thought through or not. Um, because the object of heuristic is to produce a solution which is <clears throat> in a very reasonable or quick time frame, which is good enough. Right. So what the uh, search algorithm really is doing is giving you a very quick answer, which is good enough. Okay. It's not the absolute answer. Algorithms, on the other hand, are exact. If the algorithm says A plus B is equal to C, every time you run it, it's going to give you the same thing. So these are really not algorithms per se. These are minor algorithms which are actually feeding into a heuristic of their search. But we believe Google to be giving us the best answer. Google it. That's the verb that we have. Uh, it, it is a deception if you don't understand it. Right? They're improving it. Another problem with something like Google is like if you came to me as a friend and said, okay, tell me which is the best Chinese nearby and wherever you live. And I tell them, okay, here's this shop uh, in World Trade Center or whatever it is, World Mark. And then the guy asked me, okay, why do you say that? And I'll say, why are you asking me? I won't tell you. Literally, that's what Google is. It gives you lots of answers. But if you say why, he'll say, I won't tell you. I mean, it'll tell you that I can't do this because somebody is going to game my algorithm, etc. But the fact is, you don't know. Uh, we don't realize why this is a problem. But we need to know. Um, because without transparency and proper understanding of this, it leads, leads us to accept choices. Uh, and we actually build a worldview out of it, like Facebook is doing, creating filter bubbles for people. Right? So uh, that kind of ends it for me. Uh, I hope it was useful. But uh, before I go, like in all our you know, an animation films and superhero films, there's always a post-credit slide. So I'm going to do one of that. And I'll show all my psych psychology friends, people from that, this thing, the Maslow's hierarchy. Now, this is really uh, important to be looking at. And what a wonderful graphic anyways, people kind of remember it from anywhere. What's important here is this. Uh, in the user-friendly world, we are hiding the complexity with very simple buttons. And through that, you've lost the ability to know what lies inside. You know, we cannot control things anymore. We can't take them apart anymore. Um, and to be able to question the assumptions that decided their creation. So this to me is very, very important. The user-friendly world is not necessarily the best world for you. So pizza, 30 minutes or less, that's only serving my baser needs. It's not even serving my basic needs. It's not serving my micronutrient deficiency or nutrient deficiency. What I really need is uh, healthy choices, really. Okay, so it's higher up. Uh, in the in the need uh, uh, triangle, and that's the thing. Uh, you know, would HCI, human computer interaction, or human machine interaction become humane computer interaction? Uh, so we have to start that conversation. We have to start looking at feedback loops and mental models to understand how the world works. See, everything in this world would be designed. Everything in the world is designed. Some of them poorly designed. Rather, a lot of them are poorly designed. Some of them designed pretty well. And it's going to be designed further on also. But it's up to us to understand uh, and make it, and you know, design it as humanely as possible. 
Um, so that's that's all I have to say. And over to you, Anurag. So I'm going to shut this right now. I Thank you, Joy. <laughs> it was excellent, as usual. It makes me think that, you know, what did the Lord create on the eighth day? On the eighth day, the Lord created design thinkers to carry on his work for him. <laughs> the screw-ups that happened on the first seven days have to be sorted out by the guys created on the, on the eighth day. Uh, it was fascinating to watch, uh, you know, you take the you know, journey of how this kind of thinking was itself designed uh, from the problems which happened in a nuclear power reactor to aircrafts which are crashing to the world which is now crashing. I wish we could have a simple dial that we could turn on somebody or something's head or something else which would solve our problems now. Uh, the problems with climate change, principally out of which one manifestation of which is our coronavirus crisis that we are all dealing with, trying to deal with and suffering. Many people have lost their relatives, um, you know, friends to this uh, problem. But it goes to show how really, really difficult it is to deal with a multitude of, uh, you know, power centers and a complexity of problem when there is no body, no person who has the stature to be able to, you know, bring them all together. And this is why they need the sanction of the Lord that he, they were created on the eighth day that, you know, they can have the force and the authority to begin to you know, even to put themselves on the table and say, hey, we are going to help you try to deal with this problem, whether it's the problem on our borders in, you know, Ukraine or Russia or coronavirus or whatsoever. These are all complex problems with multiple players involved and they need that kind of authority to be able to, you know, put themselves at the center of these issues. So I noticed that... Uh, there were a number of messages flowing while you were talking and uh, maybe one of the people who was messaging might like to say something. So just unmute yourself and hopefully if you think you can also put on the video, put on the video and say whatever it is that you would like to say. Hi Joy, good evening. A very, very interesting talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Apart from it opened a whole new way of thinking and seeing things. I'm just soaking it in, you know, very, very interesting. Thank you. A very, very stupid question, right? Starting from the end, when you say you can't question Google, why? So my question is, how can I question Google? Why? I mean, is there a way to question the algorithm? I mean, then they, they, then they say, we don't, I mean, you, they won't answer, but is there a way to ask them how? what algorithm they are using and if it's 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 about this let that gap in information in my mind okay so uh <laughs> interesting question and that's where a lot of these wicked problems are uh, because uh you feel that you cannot make a big change but the thing is uh, uh, when some things become narratives they bring about huge changes uh in the world uh now i'll give you an example one of the first PhDs in computer science, okay, was a woman. She was a nun, right? What is the Hollywood interpretation of computer science or what is our interpretation of computer science? It's the male dominated, dominated uh, world, right? But it's not true at all. The moment you change that narrative, you have a very different way of doing things. So it, it has to go through the population. They need to know, the girls need to know that they can actually do computer science. And it's, it's very useful for them to know that the, one of the first PhDs was, was uh, a woman. So, uh, uh, so that's how narratives change. Now coming to Google, it's important just to know, right? So I was traveling through uh, rural India and I was in, on a train 
to one of those spaces and i i could overhear conversation between uh, two people so and uh, whatever i won't get into the context of the conversation because uh, it's very political so one guy was asking all the questions the other guy was answering and they seem to be from reasonable families and this guy said you know how do you know what you're saying and this guy says i know it because it came on my whatsapp he says but why do you think whatsapp tells you everything which is truth or absolute truth or whatever it is he says no but look at this machine look at this mobile it can do so many things it tells me the right things so going back to you know that first understanding that here they believe and for india we actually went through uh, we missed a lot of steps <laughs> you know we didn't even have telephones and we got mobile phones now right and so the mobile phones become our sort of next gods for a whole lot of them they don't know they feel whatever comes through them and that's why it was so easy to turn the entire population in one way or whatever it is but we don't have to worry about that uh, there is you know there are very interesting things that happen the systems take care of themselves so uh, there is a, a philosopher called hegel i think and he's got uh, hegelian um, dialectic which essentially says that you know initially you know the pendulum swings to one one end Uh, they would be a thesis then as a reaction to that thesis there is a anti thesis okay mm-hmm. that pulls it the other way around and finally the homeostasis or the equilibrium is sort of restored so yeah we'll go from one end to the other and but but what is important from our perspective is to be aware of this and start demanding so if google doesn't do it somebody else would do it so like i was talking about the food so there is a zomato which talks about you know so many people have rated so this must be good okay so somebody else makes a business out of it but that's not complete if i were a more conscious being i would be asking okay is this a good restaurant because it uses uh natural food organic food where does it source from does it pay its uh, uh, employees properly what does it do with its waste i think okay. uh- so much of barrage of information happening so quickly it has dimmed the ability to think and question well you are <laughs> questioning today and you're questioning google also hopefully the one problem that hegel didn't have to deal with is the pendulum knocking him dead which is a super wicked problem if it hits him on the head <laughs> so then there will be no problem uh thank you uh mridu uh, yeah uh, manasi wanted to say something and then possibly dhruv Mansi do you want to say something Mansi is Joyce collaborator Michael ex collaborator oh. as well <laughs> Yeah not ex, I hope not ex uh, collaborator okay. uh, Anurag if someone tries Can you put on the video it. or is that not possible Um I'm in my pajamas I'm really okay. hesitating okay. but I'm going to dress up next time I'm sorry about that but I'm very below average uh, so there's nothing to hide Speak. in general but uh, I I I wanted to thank uh, Joy very much uh, not only for the support that he is giving to a study that uh, we are doing uh, where he's advising us but I think my my I think I put the question in the chat uh, was a little bit of more reflection around the feedback loops because these loops are um uh you know they are top down and they are also bottom up uh so i just wanted to understand from the way he articulated these questions how you know what what is there something further to know about feedback loops the second question i have are, is around inaction around um you know i i think the 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 question of climate change environmental change all of that came up uh many many times joy in your in your conversation today so um what is i i did not sufficiently understand what 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 part of what were you suggesting this this thinking and perspective can uh tell, tells us about in action uh, so that that i needed to uh, clarify from you because the evidence is very clear from both uh, from both the people who are living it 
as well as from science or policy, but there is inaction. And I think it's a similar story for mental health, I must say, in some mm -hmm. ways. So I'll stop there. But those were right. my questions. But great, very stimulating talk. Right. So uh, Feedbang, actually, it has got a whole field devoted to it. And it's called cybernetics. Uh, maybe you can look it up. It's, it's, it's a wonderful field. Uh, it's, it's a field where you talk about feedbacks. They talk about control systems. Um, and it's, it's a very fascinating field. I haven't really done a deep study on it, but I want to do it. Uh, if you do this course, I'm going to do something on cybernetics. Um, but essentially, any product design, any service design, um, we kind of tend to deliver, you know, as a hub and spoke kind of a model. We deliver it out there, use it. Oftentimes, you forget building the right kind of feedback loops uh, and that's a problem. Uh, we get to understand this much later. Uh, so, you know, even in, in conception and design of, of a product, uh, many times, when even when we're building it, we forget that we need to iterate. And the iteration is essentially always based on feedback. So who are you building for? What are they thinking about it? Why don't you do a quick and dirty prototype? Go to them, share your thoughts. We forget doing that. So we kind of make and sit and do things in isolation. And, and that's what design thinking largely is all about. <clears throat> now coming to systems thinking, in fact, to answer your second question in a slightly oblique way, um, is, is there is a whole concept of systems thinking. And systems thinking, uh, again, works on a, uh, a very simple uh, uh, thing. I mean, it's, it's really, really small that you have a very large system. You map the entire large system uh, by saying these are the stakeholders and these are the concepts, these are the nodes of the system. And you have, you map the relationships with each other. But the thing is to drive a huge uh, ship liner, you don't have to put paddles on all sides. There's a little steering that the captain has and all he does is he moves the thing and the massive megaton ship liner turns. So how does it do that? So there is something called a trim tab. There's a little trim tab on the rudder. So the, even the big ships will have huge rudders, but there's a little trim tab. That little trim tab, which is also there in planes, is a very small piece, which basically makes the pressure of the wave, the water, fall onto uh, the, the rudder and then moves the ship. So this trim tab principle is all about finding leverage in the system. The, what design thinkers would typically do is to focus a lot on problem definition and through mapping the system to find that trim tab. What would make an entire population change their behavior? What is that trim tab? What is that, that little leverage that I have? And maybe I'll put all my effort into that piece, right? So this is how things are changed. Um, <clears throat> I mean, really off the cuff. <clears throat> uh, I mean, I don't know whether this is the best forum for it, but you know, there is, we talk, talk about LGBT rights. <clears throat> so the US itself, again, you know, forget Hollywood and New York, the rest of the New York uh, Americans are that way, very conservative. And for them, all these gay rights, et cetera, was, a, was, a, was not a done thing. So many years back, there was a serial uh, that came on, I think it was NBC. It was called Will and Grace. So it was a story about this guy, Will, who's, who's gay and has got a gay friend and all that. The impact of that serial, it changed the complete narrative. Uh, people started viewing you know, this entire uh, rainbow collection in a very, very different, uh, this thing. So, you know, gays become humane again. So their treatment and perception, everything became very different because of just one seer. So, uh, you know, so there are ways of actually means and ways of using uh, these leverage points in a system, mapping the system well. Talking about, uh, I, I forgot the question. What was the second question, Mansi? Uh, sorry. I think you're, you're, you're okay. kind of answering it around okay. the inaction, I think. Right, right. 
so yeah so when you try to <clears throat> change a, a very big you know system obviously it's it's not possible and and most of the systems thinking processes they usually have a time frame like 5 years 10 years 15 years 50 years you know they know so much needs to change uh, but they don't try to change everything they look out for leverage points uh, they find those leverage points they get the right kind of people to come together uh, on the same platform uh, so you see uh, one of the things about wicket problems is that the people who are trying to you know make the change are themselves the biggest defaulters so it's not that you have to let them go very much they need to be on the table right uh, so if you talk talk about natural agriculture or natural farming so you obviously need to get probably the big guys in but you also need the small farmer he needs to be represented so you need this diverse set of people to come together and they need to be told you know we want to change this piece and we got to do it together and it is usually done over a period of time now i'm going to give you an example of natural farming organic farming and this is a case study it's a wonderful case study from andhra pradesh where one of the is officers um, did uh, did a calculation so he had to get the government to fund uh, farmers when they turn their uh, uh, farms into organic farms now usually obviously when you start organic farming you have a lot of uh, loss because of pests and etc the production also goes down produce goes down so it takes around 5 years to really come back to really start benefiting from the higher cost of organic produce and produce to get to a certain level so what he did was he did a calculation saying you know government gives out so much subsidy uh, for urea and all the fertilizers etc now how much is government subsidy calculated over a period of 10 years to so many farmers now if you put all of them together and and you know you supported these farmers for 5 years you can turn all the farms uh, into natural farms so you know very roughly very broadly these are the kind of calculations which are required so money that way or growth uh, there there are those trim tabs which are like in the government circles very important and they are very real things but you need to give them the right evidence the right uh, calculation to make this change you know with the one of the aside on what mansi was saying about climate change and mental health that you know and you were talking about wicket problems being part of bigger problems each wicket problem is part of a bigger problem that and these two are actually you know maybe inseparable problems that our mental is part of our climate you know it's not uh, separated as we were trying to talk about you know some other forum that the way that our minds are constituted is you know not uh, different from our and this word might seem familiar to you mansi terror uh, that this might yes not... it is mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, but also what joy pointed out was very interesting was the connection that maybe in another lecture we'll ask him to elaborate is the connection between heuristics and hermeneutics that how the power of a narrative the power of a story can turn uh, can turn the tide because that story captures uh, various other elements and shifts our perspective from one from one viewpoint to another because i was reminded of the paradigmatic story about slavery uncle tom's cabin and how that changed the narrative around slavery uh, Uh, quite radically and you know interestingly that's the other book that i know besides uh, uh you know our epic our indian epic in which the author says that this story was narrated to me by somebody else you know i didn't write it somebody else uh, narrated it so on that note i would ask dhruv his uh, dhruv ghosh to speak hi joy um <laughs> Yeah, that 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 was very interesting i'm i'm glad um, superna got me uh, to listen to this um I, i was very interested in the part you talked about behavioral psychology and this is something that comes from the the initial work that both of us have tried to do um in healthcare delivery um while you did speak about behavioral psychology and 
changing behaviors. But, um, I thought you spoke more of from the consumer's point of view, but in a country like India and many others where healthcare delivery and good healthcare is 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 a huge issue. And I'm not talk, talking about the you know the glass and steel hospital that you see around Delhi, but um, the actual hospitals which would probably end up giving good healthcare delivery. Uh, so my question is. Um, how do you go about changing uh, behavioral um, uh, behavior in uh, not the consumers or in this case the patients but in the per people who are doing the delivery rather um, i think what we've seen in uh, many high income countries is healthcare uh, outcomes have been better when you have um, a behavioral change where systems are followed something like an animal farm in the people who are doing the delivery rather than the one who, who uh, the healthcare is being delivered to how do we change that in a country like india because what i have found out after so many years in healthcare in india is our problem is that uh, things are not uniform and for some reason in healthcare uniformity is actually delivered uh, better um, and, and that's the project, you know, you and me trying to work on trying to change behavior in, in a surgeon, for example. How do you go about doing that? Because that's what we are struggling with uh, right now in, in many of our, um, our hospitals across uh, low and middle income countries. Right. Wow. Um, I don't have I know, <laughs> answers right away, but it, I'm, I'm, I think it's a, absolutely the apt uh, thing to be put through design thinking. And uh, I, I do have some stories of how things were changed. Uh, for example, you know, talking about, uh, you know, uh, SOPs, right? So with standardizes delivery. So if, uh, aviation industry, very strong SOPs. You have very strong SOPs in healthcare also, um, whether they're followed or not, that's a different thing. But typically, very strong SOPs there. So, but it, this is a, actually a very right kind of problem that needs uh, that, you know, make it problem solving uh, methodology and a certain kind of, uh, <clears throat> so like I was working with Manasi and I, uh, one of the things that they had in Kenya is, uh, uh, so we, so I'll tell you the project, which is, it's just really about adolescent kids uh, who get pregnant. Now it's, it's a, it's a double whammy. And, and ultimately, of course, when your 14 year old gets pregnant, um, uh, it's, it's, it's terrible for her because one, she doesn't even understand what's happened. On top of that, the, the, the society, the parents, the guardians and schools, the friends, everybody kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, is against her saying, you know, what the hell have you done? Very simply put. But they, once they get to the clinic, the healthcare clinic, the, the person who's supposed to kind of help, uh, help them, they're also, they're, they suffer a strong bias, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, they're, they're seen as the ones who got this upon themselves, I think. And Manasi probably can explain that even better. So there's, there's, there's a problem of actually in the guy, the person who needs most support there is possibly does not get it from anywhere at all. So it's, it's a really a wicked, wicked problem. Now, the, when you go to solve a problem like this, you can't go, uh, you know, tell a parent or somebody that, okay, this behavior is fine. So very risky sexual behavior is fine. So you can't tell them that. But you have to uh, tell them that, you know, if you carry on on this path, what's going to happen? And somebody who doesn't really understand what's happened to her. Uh, so you need to be, you know, supportive of her and take her through a good whatever um, prepartum and postpartum, uh, this thing support. So anyways, those are those, uh, things, but typically, uh, we need to actually look at the healthcare system as a design because no matter which country, you know, I go to, I uh, read their case studies from, they're really broken. And especially for mental health, it's really deeply broken. Now today after COVID, uh, I see there's a desperate need for mental health support in a country like India, it suffered really badly. I've got people coming to work in this house and I've seen them cry. In a moment you talk about this, oh, I lost my entire family. So they need genuine uh, support, but uh, you cannot expect the government here to you know, start setting up mental health, healthcare or uh, you know, those kinds of things. And the number of uh, mental health professionals are very less uh, and for the government has bigger problems. You know, for them, it's a smaller problem, but for an individual, it's the biggest problem. 
you can solve a physical problem <laughs> yeah, uh, with a drug or something. Mental health problem cannot be solved like that. So uh, those are the kind of things. These are exactly the problems that nobody wants to really look at because there is no very clear definition of the problem. There's no need. You cannot really create a need. You can create a business plan, but there are problems all right. But I think it needs, uh, especially what you talked about, is, is genuine design thinking and actually figuring out you know, what can be done to deliver a quality service, a certain quality of service to um, patients across rural India, especially. Uh, where... yeah, sort of, I mean, what, being, to, and, uh, being a doctor myself, uh, I've, I've found it's easier to do behavioral change. Um, in a patient than in supposedly the, the cream and the intelligent people. So uh, the patient is trying to instill a kind of behavioral change. Probably, probably you could be, uh, you'd be very intelligent. That's why you're not able to uh, adapt to that change and you have your own independent thinking or probably you're too dumb uh, to... So, um, yeah, so that is that is something that uh, right. uh, I think forward to um, right. want to healthcare in countries like ours. Right, absolutely. So yeah, so sometimes the intellect can be a curse and it prevents you from really understanding a few things. So that's why the whole concept of empathy is to actually do what we say, a journey mapping, you know, going through sometimes and meeting your, you know, many times we make decisions sitting far away from the people whom we are impacting. So actually seeing them, you know, that's why so many hospitals have doctors going out to the villages and actually seeing the conditions they live in. Uh, so, you know, either you're going to run away from it or you're going to become very, very empathic about it. So empathic design is, is really, really important from that perspective. You get closer and closer. So here I feel the Japanese have uh, brilliant processes. They have very simple processes. So I was once in uh, Maruti's plant and one of the things they said is when there is an incident on the plant, you know, the first step is get to the point where the incidents has happened. Okay, the first point, and only then you make any decisions or whatever it is. Because many times in very large plants, you know, the managers or whoever supervisors are sitting very far away from where it's happened. So, and they're making this decision in based on hearsay and stuff like that. So I think um, being in front and being in touch with the reality that way, <clears throat> with your patient uh, and bringing in certain amount of empathy uh, into the entire system and empathy is really not only just walking in somebody's shoes. It's, it's all about actually seeing what the person is seeing, feeling what the person is feeling, um, and, and actually looking at the entire circumstance. Like when we're looking at some in, uh, in Kenya, the, the children, so we're looking at the parents, the guardians, the friends. So, you know, that gives you a very good uh, rounded view of uh, how the problem needs to be solved. And that's where the core of design thinking is. Thank you. Yeah, so I think yeah. it's been a <coughs> long session. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, yeah. it is long because it's uh, interesting and uh, it's interesting, yeah. you know, because you presented it so well, so evocatively. So evocation and empathy go together. In our country, we have uh, a monkey bath, but uh, monkey bath, for those who don't understand Hindi, is... Uh, is a lecture given by our prime minister on what is on the mind. Now, it, the question that one asks is on whose mind? Is it what is on your mind or is it uh, on everybody's mind? And then that is a question which uh, uh, is a good question to ask because when you address mental health, you ask about what's on your mind. And empathy, as you pointed out, is very important. Uh, I think so is intelligence, is a, actually. So yeah. is intelligence. Like when we talk about artificial intelligence, hmm. uh, we have to see intelligence in a context. Hmm. In which context? My air conditioner is quite intelligent. You know, hmm. it's got a you know a thermostat. It knows you know when it gets too cold or too hot. So there is an intelligence there. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of actually the next world problems. We need to see all this in a context. Like you said, ask on whose mind. So as a maybe a people's representative, uh, he's probably looking at, you know, 
you know, at least he's representing a very large set of people and reflecting their aspirations, their needs, you know, from mm-hmm. that perspective. But it's important to ask. I mean, That's, I'm not getting into politics, Dhruv, but I'm saying yeah. any other system, yes. It's Dhruv important is a doctor, I suspect. <clears throat> yes, yes, he's a, he's a pediatrician. He looks like a surgeon. surgeon. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> it looks like a surgeon, interesting. <laughs> I've been in surgery myself a long time okay. ago, like many right, things. Right. I think the important thing also about empathy is that not only should you have empathy, but the person that you're empathizing with should also feel empathized with. And then when, uh, you know, you're able to, then when you come up with a solution, it is acceptable to everybody. You know, when you look at Mandela or other people, of course, the, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee, which they founded, we had big problems and had a limited success. But it's a bit like arbitration, I think, that, you know, whatever the arbitrator comes up with has to be acceptable to both parties, otherwise it loses all value. So in a way, you have done a, you know, an excellent job of explaining how the design thinker is an arbitrator between so many different aspects, so many different functions and the demands of form as well. How he constructs a narrative which is then acceptable to everybody and they can buy into it. And of course, that narrative is never permanent. It requires iteration again and again. So, you know, on the eighth day, God made design thinkers <laughs> to carry on his work in perpetuity. But you know, this session has, can't last in perpetuity. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joy. Thank you, everybody else for coming. All the people who ask questions, Dr. Dhruv, Mansi, everybody else. Thank you very much. And good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye-bye. you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great work, Anurag. Take care. Thank you so much. It was great hearing from you all. Thank you.